City of Evansville, we serve a population around 120,000. It's been a relatively flat number uh, the last several uh, census cycles. Uh, so around about 120,000. We've got several departments utilizing CityWorks and GIS. We've been users for around a decade, uh, but it's been a kind of slow methodical implementation through our organization. We've really focused primarily on distribution and collection systems within CityWorks and the GIS. And we've recently been making a push to bring our vertical assets and our plant sites um, into the system as well. Uh, and I would be remiss if I gave any presentation where I didn't mention that the city of Evansville is home to the second largest uh, street festival in the United States, second to Mardi Gras. So if you are in the Evansville area, the first full week in October, uh, go to the west side and enjoy a lot of fried food. Uh, so just a little background on the project, the work that Tim and his team and uh, us here at EWSU have done. We, we had a lot of standalone systems when it came to asset management and with respect to vertical assets in particular. Uh, our wastewater plant sites had a, a bit of a dated asset management system. Our water uh, filtration plant had a different system than the wastewater plant. And we really didn't have a good way of aggregating all of that data together. A lot of the maintenance records were on paper and in a filing cabinet in the maintenance planner's office, uh, which is not uh, too terribly uncommon, but we wanted to get all of that data together so that we could start utilizing it to its full potential. Uh, we really wanted to chase after the single source of truth that uh, is kind of the holy grail for everyone in this business. Uh, so we identified some needs where we wanted uh, a comprehensive, authoritative, uh, system of information and we wanted to be able to make decisions on a repeatable sustainable basis we didn't we didn't want to make a decision today and then question how we made it next week or next year we wanted to bring all of this together and be able to plan for our future um, so i'll turn that over to tim to really get into the nuts and bolts of kind of how we tackled that yeah thanks logan um so as with many CityWorks implementations, uh, the first step is to make some decisions about your GIS design and your GIS data that is going to be behind CityWorks. Um, so at Evansville, you know, there was one thing that we really had to take into consideration, and that was that this design that we were creating wasn't just going to be used for this project. There's going to be other uses, um, other configurations of CityWorks in the future that are going to use the same database. So we wanted to kind of think ahead so we didn't have to do more work down the road to make changes later. Um, so this project specifically was focused on Evansville's wastewater treatment plants, uh, as you can see the, the map on the right there. So we use the enterprise GIS approach to create a, a relational database that contained two feature classes. Um, so one was sites, which is basically an equivalent to uh, the parcels that Evansville owns, and then one was facilities. Uh, this mostly contained buildings, but there's a few areas, you know, in, in the treatment plants that aren't technically a building, but there's still vertical assets inside of them. Um, you know, on the bottom right there, you can see the tunnels. That would be an example of that. Uh, and then we had 13, uh, kind of a random number, 13 tables of equipment. Um, we broke these tables out based on common terminology that was already used at Evansville, as well as some, you know, industry standard trades. Uh, so electrical and HVAC and things like that. All of these tables then had a relationship back to the facility. So you can highlight a facility uh, such as the, the image here, um, maintenance administration building, and then you can see all of the related assets inside of that facility. Uh, when designing the actual tables, uh, we, we had some standard fields across all of the tables. So um, something like the related facility ID. You know, we needed that key identifier to relate back to the facility. Um, also a serves field. Uh, you know, I was talking before, we might use this in the future for water treatment plants or lift stations. So we have a serves field in there that, you know, tracks that these assets are specific to wastewater, not water. Um, and then we had some asset, um, uh, some asset specific fields. So, um, you know, for electrical, 
we want to track the voltage on electric assets. Um, we also have an asset type field with unique domains for each table. Um, so a domain, a drop down. So for HVAC, you know, you can select that that HVAC piece of equipment is an air handling unit, for example. Um, another key thing here, and I'll, I'll talk about this numerous times throughout this presentation, but uh, we gathered all these requirements and did all this design on spreadsheets, uh, a tool that's familiar to pretty much everybody. So uh, we were, you know, trying to put tools in the hands of the end users that they're familiar with. Um, and then we just took those spreadsheets and plugged them into a Python tool that just built out the database. So uh, in the long run, it saved us quite a bit of time on this project. All right, so, so now we got the GIS database built out. The next step was populating that. Um, so Evansville had you know, multiple sources of information, uh, one of them being Antero, their, their old asset management system. And so we pulled all this information out into spreadsheets and uh, realized that it definitely needed some cleanup. So the uh, Logan and uh, the end user staff was nice enough to go through and do some data cleanup um, and also assign, here you can see in the table above, uh, assign an asset group and an asset type to every asset that corresponds with the GIS data. Um, there was some inconsistency, so this really helped to uh, define everything in a similar fashion before we loaded it into the GIS. Um, lastly, uh, once again, like I said, uh, we used automation, we used Python to just load this data from those spreadsheets directly into the corresponding GIS table and it saved us a lot of time so we didn't have to do any manual GIS editing. All right, so onto the big task. Uh, we now got the GIS database with the GIS databases populated with all this equipment data. And now we had to look at how, how do we want to design CityWorks? So we started by reviewing all of the uh, previous at, um, work templates that were in Antero. Um, as you can see there, we after reviewing the data, we determined there was over a thousand templates being used. So the, the reason for this was that they, they weren't simplified, they weren't consistent. So there might be a change oil in pump one, uh, change oil for pump two. Uh, so there was a lot of templates that were really doing the same thing, um, but not necessarily defined the same. So we took some time, uh, once again, with uh, Logan's help, we, we scrubbed these spreadsheets and were able to or sorry, scrub the templates and we're, we're able to simplify it down to 78 work order and 65 inspection templates. That number seems, seems like a lot still. And the reason for that is these are all cyclical inspections. So uh, we, we wanted to include that cycle on the template. So the user didn't have to change that when they're in there uh, doing that work. So we might have a change oil annually, change oil monthly, change oil biannually. So they're really the same work activity. Um, they're, they're just defined as a different template. So, so lastly here um, with the information from Antero, we found there was a ton of useful information in this, in this system, but it was all put into one field um, a lot of the time. So uh, the, specifically the supervisor that works for Evansville, he, he has so much information that he was logging in this system um, and it included information about the assets. Uh, it included information about the work that he was specifically doing on that asset. And you can see an example here in the instructions. Uh, so, you know, he includes the type of filters to use, the type of oil to use, uh, any tips and trips, tricks, you know, sometimes he'll even include, include the uh, wrench size that you need to take off bolts. So uh, we wanted to maintain this data. There's not a good place to put something this descriptive uh, in CityWorks unless we went through and parsed out every single instruction and pulled these into you know individual fields maybe in the GIS. Uh, so what we did is we we wrote a tool that basically grabbed all this information uh, from the Antero data and created PDFs. Uh, so here's an example of one on the right and this we, we have it organized in a way that you can click on you know go into a file structure wastewater treatment plant west uh, facility building and all the equipment with the associated PDF if there was this information for that asset. So, so now the end users are able to attach these PDFs to work orders, to inspections, to have that additional level of information when they go out to complete the work. 
All right, so a little bit on the CityWorks workflow that, that we went with. Um, we went with a kind of a hybrid approach between CityWorks Office and CityWorks Mobile, uh, being that Evansville was already using this, they already had the devices, so it, it made it pretty easy transition. Uh, so to talk through this diagram here on the right, the work is initiated um, and we're actually going to be loading in all those first instances of the work orders and inspections into the system. So the supervisor then is going to submit that to a user out in the field or one of his staff. They're going to open up CityWorks Mobile, complete the work, and submit it back then to the supervisor for review. If he finds something you know isn't complete, he's going to submit it back to the user. They're going to mark it complete again once they're done, and it's going to be closed out by the supervisor. Once the supervisor closes that out, um, many of you probably know on a cyclical work order inspection, the uh, child is created with that projected start date uh, based on the interval of that cycle. So that'll be sitting in the inbox then ready for the next time it comes around. Now, one of the reasons that we did it this way was, uh, you know, the staff have a job to do and it's not their job to sit out there on in the field on their device in city works for three or four hours a day. They just go in, you know, look at what they have to do that day, mark them complete. And that's all they're really in the system. And then the supervisors and they're monitoring and uh, making sure everything remains clean in there. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about this first uh, lesson learned or summary of this project here. Uh, project efficiency, you know, it was really important that Logan and, and management and the end users all were on board with this upfront. They all knew what we were gonna be doing um, and that really helped us move this project along. They were excited about it and there was great buy-in from everybody. Uh, but, you know, one thing is there's always these tools at everyone's disposal that maybe aren't used as much. Um, in this case, we used a lot of Python to move this project along. I think we completed the bulk of it in under three months. So it was a pretty quick project, even though there was a lot of activities being done uh, throughout it. So Logan, I'll let you take over. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I, I... I like this. I let Tim handle all of the nitty gritty and then I come in for the finish line. Uh, this works out really well. Um, the biggest uh, lesson learned or biggest uh, advice that I can give is get your end users involved early and often. Uh, building that ownership with the, the ladies and gentlemen that are going to be using this every day uh, after the project is completed, it's just invaluable. And so we had the head of maintenance, we had him involved very early and often. Him and I would sit and comb through spreadsheets together and do some of this uh, kind of data scrubbing. And that that worked out really well because now he feels like he's got a stake in the game and he really wants to take this and run with it rather than it being a tool that we developed and the end user doesn't necessarily want it. Um, and then we also, like Tim mentioned before, we designed with the future in mind, we took an enterprise approach. So this project specifically was limited to our wastewater treatment plants, but we built it knowing that we were going to, at completion, take this and try to run with it towards our water plant, towards our lift stations, towards our booster pump and water towers. Um, any other vertical asset site within our utility, we want to take this concept and apply it um, to, to build out the entire system. So that's kind of what is next. Uh, we are scoping a project currently to basically validate all of the vertical asset data that we have uh, within our GIS database. We want to go out and actually lay eyes on every vertical asset that we say that we own and make sure that make model serial number, condition assessments, everything is completed. Uh, and then we want to, uh, at fruition, we want to, to basically mirror this concept again and apply it to all of our different vertical asset sites. So whether that's treatment plants, whether they are certain asset types, um, this, this was kind of our pilot project. And now that we've seen success, we want to take this and run with it throughout the rest of the system. Uh, so that'll be a big lift. Uh, we're going to, uh, while we're out there, we're going to be putting tags on every asset so we can come back and kind of have a little bit more streamlined functionality in the future. Uh, so we're really excited for that and we're uh, we're excited for the work that we've done already. Uh, it's working out very well and we hope that we just uh, keep running down that road. 